talk to you guys about how not to get yourself into um, spaghetti code mess in your CSS. So I just want to do a quick survey. So raise your hand if you've had to write important just so you can override some other important. <laughs> yes, I thought so. Um, raise your hand again if changing CSS makes your palms sweat because you're so worried that things are going to break. Good, thought so too. Um, so I've raised my hand um, both times because I myself have been in these situations way more times than I really like. And you know, it's really painful, it's very dissatisfying when you have to constantly battle with this messy CSS. And a small part of me just dies a little bit every time I have to write this important just so I can get some styles to work. Um, so no matter how good you are, if you have to constantly battle with messy code, it's extremely difficult to produce quality code. Um, so I think one of the key things in having maintainable CSS is to create reusable and robust components. So today I'm going to use this uh, CNN website as an example. And in particular, I'm going to talk about this box component and um, illustrate some of the steps I follow when creating a reusable component. I'll also be referring to some of the concepts from our OCSS open source project and also talk about how CSS helps to a certain extent. So when we're building the components, the first thing we should always do is to build the simple ones first. Because a lot of the times, the complicated ones are often made up of the simple ones. So we should learn to spot the patterns when we are um, looking at the components we want to build. So in the case of the box, um, we have these four boxes. They all have different styles. But the one common thing they have is they have a common uh, padding of about 10 pixels. So I call this uh, base component box. And then I add a skin class. In this case, I'm going to call it Insight News for the moment to apply the specific styles to that box. Um, so having that base component which applies the common styling, you, know, you avoid a lot of duplication. Um, you make your code lighter and uh, much easier to maintain down the track. The next thing I want to look at is naming your component. Uh, I think naming is probably one of the most difficult things we do as a developer. Um, so here we have uh, the box. I call it Insight News. So this class is really tied to the content. And as soon as the content changes, then the class no longer makes sense. Um, you know, it still works, but then it might you know, confuse developers when they're trying to maintain it. And sometimes I would get a design, and I would see a component on the page, and I'll think to myself, oh, you know, I'll only ever use this component on this one page. I'll never use it again on anywhere else. But I can tell you 90% of the time, a few months down the track, I would get another page with the component using a completely different context. And I always kick myself thinking, you know, why didn't I abstract this earlier? So I think it's a good idea to try to be abstract um, right from the start and always think that the component can be reused. Uh, a lot of people say that class names shouldn't tie to the content, it shouldn't tie to styles. So I've done silly things like where I've named boxes like box one, box two, box three. So they're really abstract. They're not tied to anything. But after a while, when I try to maintain that code, I'll be looking at the class thinking, you know, what is this for? Where have I used it? Um, so I think a better name for that, maybe something like box feature. You can still argue the class is somewhat tied to the styles, but I believe that you know, things can never be one-sided. And we need to learn to find the middle ground. So having something that is abstract but also um, easy to understand, I think is really important. Another thing to consider when building components is that your components should just work. And what I mean by this is that um, because everyone on the team will probably have different levels of understanding of CSS. And we don't want people to be using the component and have to worry about how the CSS works behind it. And it should just work as intended when they use it on the page. So clear fix is uh, one of those things that we don't want people to have to worry about. We don't want them to have things floated inside a box, and then suddenly the box model collapsed, and they're thinking, like, what the hell happened? And then they have to add on this clear fix class. You know, it's really prone to error if we, if we um, don't uh, have a component that just works by default. So because boxes are so commonly used, um, it is very likely that, that we will have elements floated inside it. Um, so I think adding a clear fix to it um, preemptively is, um, is a good idea. So this is when SAS um, is really useful. Um, and they have this really useful function called extend. So what it does is that it allows you to inherit the styles of another selector. So we look at two ways that you can do this. Um, first way is that you can extend the selector. 
So we can have a class that does the micro clear fix, like so. Uh, and then we can have a box that extends the clear fix class. So in the output, you see that the, we have the micro clear fix, and we see that the box also has the micro clear fix as well. So when the developers use that, you know, the micro clear fix is already there for them. Another way of doing this is using um, SAS a placeholder selector, where the styles won't actually get compiled until you extend it. And because we want to build in ClearFix as part of the component all the time, um, rather than having the ClearFix class in your CSS, which we probably won't be using, um, we can just use the placeholder selector. So if we go back to the box, um, then you can extend percentage ClearFix, calling the um, placeholder selector. And then you see that the ClearFix class doesn't actually get output, and the micro ClearFix is only being applied on the box component. So in OSCS, is another place where the place of the selector is being used is for the base spacing. Um, it's a good idea to um, try to set a default top and bottom margin for most of your components, because you probably need them for most of the time. And rather than using an actual class to do this, we can use a place of the selector that applies the margin um, top and bottom of 15 pixel for this component. And then in your um, components, you can just extend that base um, spacing place or the selector. And you see that in your output CSS, um, the base spacing class is, uh, uh, properties is only being set on the components where you've called them. But with great power comes great responsibilities. Extend in SAS is really useful, and it can definitely help you eliminate a lot of the repeated CSS. But it also has its downside if we're not careful. So in the base box component, we extend the base spacing. And then we've got two other boxes that apply different styles to it. And we, wanna, we want them to have the same uh, styles as the base box component. So we extend the base box component. And then we want to use the box in other components as well. So in this case, we want to use them in the tabs and in the drop down menu. And when you check your output CSS, you see that you know, it's actually outputting classes that we don't actually want. We've got tabs, box feature, tab, box basic. You know, we never really wanted them. So the downside extent is that it'll extend all the places where you've actually uh, used that class that, um, that you called. And so therefore, it's always important to check your output CSS um, when you're using extend or when you're using SAS, really. Um, otherwise, you might get crazy selectors like that, and your team is probably not going to like you very much. And when we're naming our classes, uh, namespacing them can have a lot of benefits. So here we've got the box component again, and we want to try to style the header and the heading. And if we give it generic class names like header and heading, and in SAS, we probably need to nest them within the component in case the same class names are being used in other components because the class names are so generic. But if you namespace your class by prefixing your inner elements with the name of the component as well, then you can avoid um, the styles being overridden by, the, by other components because your class names are already scoped within the box component. So you don't actually need to nest them. And you end up having a shorter selector. And as you build more and more components, um, this will help um, with the weight of your CSS a lot. So just remember that when you're using SAS, just because you can nest, doesn't mean you, uh, you, you should all the time. Um, I know sometimes it feels really good to be able to just nest things according to them, but that's probably not a very good idea. The last thing I want to touch on is um, something a bit non-technical, but I think is a, a really critical, critical thing in making sure that your code doesn't turn into a mess, and that is communication. So first form of communication that we should always have within a team is setting a code standard. So this is a code standard that not just live inside your head. It needs to be written down, um, communicated across the team, as, and make sure that you know, any new members who join the team knows about it. Because otherwise, as more and more people join your team, you have people come and go, you're going to end up with these you know, different styles of writing CSS. And you're gonna be, you know, it's just going to get into a big mess. Another really important thing to have is a living style guide. So a living style guide is a style guide that uses actual code and actual real examples rather than the static PDF. Um, this is really important in documenting both your, uh, your design and your code. 
and it's the one place where the whole team can look at to see what components have been built, how they're being used, um, you know, what JavaScript it is, you know, how everything looks, um, so that the whole team is aware of what's already there on the site. It's also really important that we work closely with the designers and collaborate with them. Um, if we can avoid creating new CSS by um, using something that already exists on the site, which does probably 80 to 90% of the job, maybe we can try to go back to the designer and you know, ask them, hey, can we reuse this component we already got? Because then you know, we, we don't need to write new CSS. You know, it will become you know, more maintainable down the track. I'm not saying that we don't follow the design. I'm just saying that we, I think there needs to be more of a balance between UX design and the code as well. So a really good talk that talks about this is by Harry Roberts, um, who did a talk recently at CSS Conf EU, and I highly recommend everyone to have a look, because it's a fantastic talk. And um, that's the end of my presentation, and I've got some extra resources here for anyone who wants to um, look at some of these concepts more later. And I hope that you know, spaghetti will only ever appear at your dinner table and not in your CSS. Thank you, and happy coding.